and gentlemen, welcome here for this conference on CR3 and more, uh, where we, uh, when the, the, now that the trilogue is starting, we have all the stakeholders uh, in the room or on screen. Um, it's modern time, so we have a slight technical problem uh, because the HDMI uh, connection has been uh, broken. So uh, you will not see the people online, but we can hear and uh, discuss the whole uh, topic. It's an honor and a privilege as chair of RFR to welcome you in this room and to welcome Osin, also Veronica Mezano for her first conference organized with us. Uh, she's a freelance, I would say, yeah. <laughs> a moderator for the RFR, and it's a big privilege to have her expertise and her knowledge on all these topics. Um, we will discuss a, 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 an issue that I know is very much uh, in the debate uh, in Paris, but not only in Paris. Uh, and I wish, I just one wish, maybe for this morning, is that everybody will discuss Basel III and no other figure. Um, this topic has been on the table now for a very long time. And um, I know there are other topics around around to be discussed. And I have the feeling that maybe if we dedicate too much time on this one, there might be other topics coming around that we don't notice or that we don't care about so much that worth being also looked at. So I think as uh, Jean Lemire said in the last Eurofi conference, it's time to apply this agreement and to look for other topics. This topic is very specific for European banks, of course, even though we don't have an EU banking architecture, there are some EU specificity with the issue of an internal model or the output floor. Nevertheless, I think we have a mandate in the Council and in the European Parliament, and it's time for the co-legislator to finalize this agreement, also because day after day, you can see new events coming in the banking landscape where people are requiring new uh, credential safeguards and asking, where is Basel III? No, I just want to finish this introduction, which you a very likely debate uh, with an image or not. Uh, and uh, I look forward for all your discussion. It's a very important one and a very timely one. So now uh, let's start the full debate. Veronique, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to see uh, so many familiar faces. So, um, um, and as as uh, as Pervan says, I'm, I'm I'm here as a, as an independent uh, expert now that I've left uh, BNP Paribas. Um, it's a great honor also to have such a distinguished panel. We figured when we uh, arranged to meet in this conference with Pervenche mm -hmm. that uh, CRS3 would be one of the main topics on the agenda. Well, it is still, but of course, uh, new events have occurred since then. So I'm sure, although this is not the, the, the purpose of today, uh, it will come and, or it will be uh, in the background of our discussions. And uh, maybe there will be room for another uh, uh, conference. We, we could focus maybe more on the questions on liquidity, on interest rate risks, and, 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 uh, and, and other, um, and other more, maybe more current or more, uh, more urgent issues. But Bardo 3 remains on the table. Uh, as Pervenche said, we are at the beginning of the, of the trilogue, and so we wanted to have the three um, co-legislators uh, present, and I'm really uh, very honored that uh, uh, both Martin Merlas on the Commission side, um, uh, Eric Lentorf of the Swedish Presidency, and Gabriel uh, from the BGT, uh, and Jonas Fernandez, the reporter on the Parliament, are the three of them, uh, three constituencies, I would say, Four people, three constituencies are there to, to share their views and, and uh, uh, inform us on the latest um, uh, direction of, of travel. Um, then we'll have uh, a panel also with uh, um, private sector representatives. Uh, I thank them uh, as well, uh, in particular, Jonas Bjarke Jensen from Copenhagen, who is 
sitting here in Paris, uh, so we won't have any video issue. I hope by then we can uh, we can see uh, Christian Castro of Kaisha and uh, Joanna Ort uh, from uh, uh, Skandinavska and Skilda Bank. Uh, apologies for the pronunciation. Um, so uh, we are really here for fostering dialogue. So as always in the AEFR um, events, there will be a large Q&A session at the end um, so that we can uh, really uh, debate the, what uh, the, the various speakers we have brought uh, on the table. And um, unfortunately, Martha and Anna will not be able to stay uh, all the, the whole morning. So there will be a short Q&A session more specific to uh, Martin. Uh, at the end of his slot. So please prepare one or two questions already in your minds uh, uh, if you want to ask uh, things um, to, to Martin with this. Uh, I hope Martin can hear us. Martin, I uh, want Yes, to uh, I can hear you uh, very well. Okay, perfect. M many thanks for, for taking the time to, to be with us. Uh, if you had the video, uh, you would see quite a full room actually here in Paris and many people in the, in the, on the line as well. So um, I, I um, only see you, Veronique. Okay, so that's <laughs> better than nothing. But <laughs> okay, and we, we can't see you at all, but uh, hopefully we will solve that uh, in, uh, as soon as possible. So many thanks for participating. Um, the order of, of the, the sequence between the Commission, the Council and the Parliament is by no means any uh, hierarchy of importance. It's rather um, just a chronological order as the Commission put on the table its, propo its proposal first uh, in November 2021. So please, uh, um, we, um, we are keen to hear from you um, what is the view of the Commission, how you try to find this balance that Pervanche was mentioning between uh, EU specificities and faithful implementation uh, of Basel. Uh, so um, please, Martin, with no further ado, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Véronique. Thank you, uh, Pervanche. And I, I am sorry that uh, I am not able to be with you in, in Paris uh, today. Um, before um, entering into the, the main topic of the day, uh, namely uh, the uh, CRD, CRR trilogues, I will say maybe a few words about our legislative proposal uh, so that uh, everybody uh, recalls uh, the logic uh, behind our proposal and its main uh, features. You remember, of course, that uh, the great financial crisis uh, uh, taught us uh, that a, a number of weaknesses uh, had to be addressed uh, in the European uh, uh, regulatory uh, framework and in other frameworks, of course, across uh, uh, the globe. Um, and uh, if we uh, do so, uh, uh, we will have a, a European banking sector that uh, would be better able to adapt to new challenges, uh, possible uh, other turmoil, and a sector that uh, will continue to be able to lend to the economy uh, even uh, even in difficult uh, times. Um, so there's an urgency to uh, to finish the Basel III job so that uh, the banking sector can continue to uh, perform its function in a sustainable way. Also, of course, uh, the failure of uh, three US banks and Credit Suisse uh, in the past few days uh, even if not directly linked to European banks, uh, reminds us of the importance of having uh, sound prudential uh, rules in place, uh, as well as close and intrusive uh, supervision. And on that, uh, uh, probably um, uh, we, we see now that uh, it was a, a good choice uh, uh, in the EU to implement Basel III to all banks, and not only to so-called uh, internationally uh, active banks. Clearly, uh, there will have to be lessons uh, to be drawn from the failures of uh, SVB and Credit Suisse in particular. And uh, you may have seen that uh, the Basel Committee met last week and uh, decided uh, to take stock of the regulatory and supervisory implications of uh, these uh, recent events. But in parallel to that, in the EU, but also in other major jurisdictions, uh, we must uh, press ahead with the finalization of Basel III uh, to foster confidence by uh, tackling uh, outstanding issues in the regulatory framework. 
uh, the previous banking packages, uh, in particular CRR2 and CRD5, had already uh, allowed us to uh, enhance the resilience of the European banking sector with a much higher and a better quality capital requirements, uh, less leverage, uh, uh, strict uh, liquidity requirements, and also less reliance on uh, short-term wholesale funding. Uh, the fundamentals of European banks are, are good. Uh, they meet high prudential standards and are subject uh, to uh, strict supervision. Um, the ongoing finalization of Basel III uh, will complement these achievements uh, with the following main objectives uh, to improve the simplicity, the comparability and the risk sensitivity of the regulatory framework in order in particular to uh, uh, create more confidence in risk-based capital requirements. Implementing these requirements is particularly important, of course, uh, for European banks, given their high reliance on internal models and also the need uh, to support uh, international regulatory uh, convergence. We think that uh, our legislative proposals published in October 2021 uh, achieve these objectives. Uh, they strike a delicate balance between three uh, potentially uh, competing political goals. Uh, first, uh, being faithful to the Basel standards. Second, uh, taking into account uh, certain European specificities and notably the fact that we apply uh, Basel III to all banks, and thirdly, uh, also uh, the need to avoid undue or excessive increases in capital requirements uh, for banks. This is why our proposal includes uh, temporary adjustments that aim at uh, smoothening the transition to the new regime, uh, ensuring that the final requirements are in line with the agreed international standards. In particular, transitional arrangements relate uh, in relation to the output floor to unweighted corporates, low risk uh, mortgages, and uh, 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 derivatives calculation in relation to SACA. Uh, the objective behind these transitions is to avoid cliff, ev cliff, ev edge effects, cliff, ev cliff edge effects and also uh, allowing banks to uh, have enough time to adapt to the introduction of the output flow. We also decided to keep uh, certain adjustments to the Basel standards that had been decided uh, by the legislature in recent negotiations, uh, for example, the SME supporting factor and the infrastructure supporting factor. Um, they also reflect certain uh, distinctive uh, features of the European banking sector. And we thought that uh, 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 they also uh, address concerns on the potential significant uh, overall increase in capital requirements. And we took the view that it is up to the legislator to keep these adjustments uh, to the Basel standards uh, or not. Um, we estimate that the average impact of our proposal um, uh, uh, would be uh, lower than a 10% increase in capital requirements uh, for the uh, European banking sector in general. And thus, we, we do think that we meet the objective uh, set at political level to avoid uh, significant increases in capital. But of course, uh, distribution matters, uh, distribution between different types of banks which means that uh, we seek to add capital where it is needed in the European banking sector, notably as a result of the output floor and the introduction of the fundamental review of the trading book, but not uh, across the board in an indiscriminate uh, manner. Another objective of the proposal is to strengthen the resilience of the sector to environmental, social and governance risks, here, our proposal is introducing ESG risks in the prudential framework. We think this is a significant step in the transition to climate neutrality for the banking sector. 
And we're also putting forward a comprehensive minimum harmonization framework for the regulation and supervision of third country branches operating in the EU. We think uh, here as well that this proposal is uh, largely vindicated by uh, recent events. Accordingly, third country branches, if the legislator agrees, would be subject to harmonized requirements on authorization, capital, liquidity, governance and reporting. We think this is necessary to address uh, risks to financial stability that uh, result from the increasing volume of banking business that third country groups conduct, notably through branches in the EU. So as you well know, we have uh, started now the trilogue negotiations. Here, first a word on the timeline. Uh, 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 Council and Parliament have uh, finalized their respective uh, positions. And um, therefore, we are hopeful that uh, we can finalize the trilogues uh, at the end of the Swedish uh, presidency, uh, so in June. We know that the Swedish uh, presidency is very committed uh, to meet this uh, objective. Um, and if we do so, uh, that would allow us to uh, 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 stick to the implementation debt that uh, we had set in our proposal, namely January 2025. This will be challenging uh, given the number of uh, technical and political issues that need to be addressed, but um, we think it is uh, doable. Um, uh, trilogues have started well uh, in a very constructive uh, spirit uh, and therefore uh, we are hopeful that we can uh, meet these uh, deadlines. Now a few words on, on how in the Commission we, uh, we approach uh, the trilogues. Of course, uh, uh, we will play, as in all trilogues, a mediating role with a view to facilitating an agreement between the co-legislators and uh, supporting them notably from a technical standpoint. Um, both Parliament and Council introduced a number of amendments to our proposal, but overall uh, we do see a, a strong convergence between Council and Parliament. They are not far apart, which is normal given uh, their shared willingness to be uh, as consistent with the Basel standards as uh, as possible. Uh, uh, more importantly, we think that the balance between the different objectives of the legislative package that we proposed in our proposal is uh, is kept, which is uh, which is very important. So uh, there is a, a shared understanding of what uh, the political balance should be in terms of outcomes. Um, this being said, there are several elements that will uh, merit uh, political discussions uh, in the trilogues uh, and where for the moment Council and Parliament uh, diverge. I think that one of the main points of discussion will concern uh, the output floor and in particular its level of application and also the transitional arrangements that uh, accompany it. As you know, the Council seeks uh, uh, to have an application of the output floor at consolidated level and individual level, uh, an approach which may be seen as more costly uh, in terms of uh, capital. On its side, the European Parliament uh, stays closer to our proposal with an application at a consolidated level in combination with the distribution mechanism uh, towards uh, the sub-consolidated level. This is what we had proposed and uh, we do think that this is more coherent uh, with the objectives of establishing a banking union and also with a proper functioning of the single market. But of course, we look forward to the negotiations on that. The Parliament text also introduces provisions to foster the granting of domestic and cross-border liquidity waivers, uh, which is a sensitive topic. Um, uh, and as you know, in, in Council, there is some uh, uh, opposition uh, in relation to that, uh, with a certain countries uh, uh, fearing that domestic uh, banks belonging to foreign groups might not have enough capital and liquidity at the local level, so this is bound to be uh, sensitive. 
Other significant differences between Council and Parliament persist in the area of cross-border provision of banking services um, uh, and uh, third country branches. Uh, here, as I said, we, we do think in the Commission that a prudent approach is, uh, is, is needed as illustrated by uh, recent events. On ESG risks, both the Council and the Parliament exclude bringing sustainability or climate change considerations into the Pillar 1 requirements. Uh, there is a need on that to await uh, the report from the European Banking Authority, which uh, should be published later this year. Nevertheless, the Parliament reinforces the link of banks' prudential transition plans uh, with their sustainability commitments and also reinforces powers for bank supervisors to enforce adjustments to banks' prudential transition plans. Obviously, we are paying great attention to developments in other key jurisdictions to make sure that a level playing field is maintained. Um, we have been discussing with uh, uh, counterparts in the United States and the United Kingdom uh, in particular. You know that draft rules are out in the UK. Uh, draft rules should be out uh, in uh, the summer uh, uh, in the US. Um, and that should allow uh, uh, a convergence uh, towards uh, starting application in 2025 uh, for these three jurisdictions. Um, of course, I cannot speak for the UK and the US, but uh, it is certainly the goal to make sure that we converge and that uh, there are no uh, undue delays and, and no discrepancies between our jurisdictions if possible. However, if uh, uh, certain ju jurisdictions are delayed in comparison to the EU, uh, you know that our proposal includes uh, certain tools uh, to make sure that uh, our banks um, uh, do not suffer uh, from delays uh, outside the EU. And for the fundamental review of the trading book in particular, um, we have proposed a, a delegated act that may uh, reconsider the timeline of application of FRTB or indeed its content. And I was glad to see that uh, both Council and Parliament uh, broadly endorsed that. So to conclude, I would say that the balance between the di different objectives of the legislative package uh, that I outlined at the beginning uh, should continue to guide our work in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, we are now finishing a reform uh, we started uh, a decade ago. Um, uh, and clearly, uh, this is urgent given that the current context uh, confirms the need to act fast in order to further strengthen prudential standards. And I'm sure that uh, the co-legislator will, will have this in mind as we approach uh, the finishing line of the negotiations. I'll stop here, Veronique, and I'm, I'm happy to take a, a couple of questions. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for um, a very uh, complete um, uh, setup of the, of the landscape and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the situation at the beginning of the, of the trilogue. Um, maybe one question on, on my side before turning to the audience. Um, the, at the beginning of the trilogue, the Commission has also tabled uh, a number of uh, proposals. Um, could you say a word on um, on 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 those and and why they were proposed uh, at this stage and how they may uh, uh, develop uh, how the dialogue may develop on those? Uh, do you refer to subjects like uh, uh, crypto assets or securitization? Is this what you have in mind? Yes. Well, to be honest, uh, we haven't tabled uh, anything uh, yet. Uh, we only had uh, one uh, political uh, uh, trilogue uh, where we mainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, prepared um, uh, work uh, for the upcoming technical and political trilogues. Um, there are uh, provisions on uh, securitization uh, and crypto assets in the uh, Parliament's report. So this means that uh, uh, co-legislators will have a, uh, to take a position on, on these two uh, topics, uh, whether or not uh, in particular we um, 
uh, implement uh, the Basel standard on uh, uh, banks' exposures to crypto assets, and also whether or not uh, we aim at providing some alleviations in terms of capital requirements in the area of securitization um, in light of uh, the EBA report on the matter. If we are asked uh, to uh, to produce papers on, uh, on on these topics, we will do so. We we may decide to do so also on on our own initiative, but this hasn't been uh, done uh, uh, yet. Um, there are also discussions uh, surrounding uh, macro prudential uh, tools, uh, um, and as you know, uh, the uh, the Basel Committee has adopted. Uh, 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 um, guidelines on the matter uh, relatively recently. That said, this does not feature in the um, um, in, in the parliament text, nor in the council text, so we'll need to see what to do on that. But no decision has been taken in this respect in, uh, in the commission. Thank you, this is very clear. Any 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 question? Alban, so I will... Uh... Do, 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 do I need a microphone or... No, no? It, it's very loud. Okay. So I to put that here. Uh, can you hear me, Martin? I do. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, good, good morning. Um, Introduce us because he can yes, see you. Yes, uh, my, my name is uh, Alban Point. Can you hold up so he can see you? Ah, okay. <laughs> so I can see you, Alban. <laughs> okay, Alban Point, Group Crédit Agricole. So uh, my question is about... Uh, uh, this implementation of Battle 3 in the present context, because we, we can hear here and there that it's urgent to apply uh, very uh, strictly uh, the Basel Agreement. And uh, this is a bit surprising because as far as I can see the situation, uh, the problem is not uh, the weak implementation of Basel 3 in Europe. The problem is a weak implementation of Battle 3 in the US. Because uh, uh, we, we discover that uh, they only apply Basel III to 13 banks, and that most of American banks are not subject uh, to the Basel III rules. First, uh, second, we see also that even for large banks, the implementation of Basel III as it is now is partial. For instance, the American standard does not include uh, the uh, uh, operational risks or the CVA, which represents a, a, a discount of 30%. Uh, so the, the, the first aim for the Europeans should to ask Americans at the Basel Committee to promptly, uh, completely uh, implement the, the, the Basel III uh, uh, agreement. Uh, the second remark is about uh, the, the situation uh, today. Uh, concerning uh, uh, the, the impact of the, this implementation in Europe. I, I remind you that the, the purpose of the Basel uh, III agreement was not to uh, increase significantly the capital uh, requirements. It is written in the, the first page of, of this agreement. And so a strict uh, implementation doesn't mean a significant increase in, in capital requirement. It means a better framing of the presidential uh, uh, regulation. And it, when you look at the figures, and, and for instance, uh, the last figures released by the EBA uh, concerning the implementation, uh, uh, it was in September 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the impact would be uh, plus 11% uh, for all banks, plus 12% for uh, G1 uh, Group Bank and plus 20% for GCIPS. And even when taking into account the adjustment uh, in, in, the, uh, in the package, you see that finally uh, the impact would be, uh, with all these measures, even uh, according to the CBA, uh, very significant. And so uh, my question is, uh, do you think that uh, the, the balance which has been reached in, in the package at, at, at this moment uh, concerning uh, uh, the proposal of the Commission and also uh, the, the, the deal which was uh, voted at, at, the, at the Parliament and at the Council, uh, do you think that it will be possible to keep the, the right balance between 
uh, a faithful implementation uh, of the package and the due taking into account of the uh, European specificities. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Alban. I'll start with, with the EU. Uh, of course, the Commission has uh, impacted, assessed its own proposal. Um, uh, we do not have an impact assessment for uh, the Council's and Parliament's text. But as I said, uh, we see clearly that both texts uh, remain very close uh, to the Commission proposal. And therefore, I think that uh, uh, the figures that you see in our impact assessment remain uh, very uh, 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 much valid. Um, you remember that uh, we had uh, forecast uh, uh, an increase in capital requirements just below uh, 10% uh, for the banking sector in general in the EU. Um, and I think uh, by and large, we, we, we stick to that figure. Of course, uh, Alban, this is, uh, you know, in aggregate at regional level, um, uh, it may be less for some banks, it may be more for other banks as a result of the uh, 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 requirements of substance that are being introduced. Um, uh, so that was always the idea, avoiding significant increases uh, for the sector as a whole. Um, uh, but if uh, more capital uh, 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 has to um, uh, be put aside in, in some uh, specific banks, that's the result of the Basel standards and we have to accept that. Uh, on, uh, on the US, well, uh, clearly uh, there are lessons to be drawn uh, from the failure of SVB for uh, US uh, policymakers and, and, and regulators. Um, we are, of course, uh, discussing the matter bilaterally and also in the Basel Committee with the United States. Uh, I cannot speak for them. Uh, the decision has been taken a few years ago in the US uh, to apply dot franc um, to uh, uh, less banks. Uh, and as a result, a relatively significant banks like SVB was not subject to all the Basel three requirements. It will up be up to the US authorities uh, to decide um, uh, what to do with the thresholds uh, that uh, they have in place and whether or not they want to uh, move these thresholds. So um, this is uh, up to them. On our side, the one, uh, you know, uh, conclusion that uh, we need to draw is that we need to pay particular attention to third country branches operating uh, in uh, uh, the uh, EU. You remember that uh, SVB had uh, in particular one, one branch in the EU, and uh, we have to make sure uh, uh, that, uh, you know, these uh, branches are subject to uh, minimum requirements that ensure uh, safety and soundness. Back to you, Veronique. Thank you, Martha. Um, I see on the line uh, a question or uh, a hand raised by Tamar Julia of IACPM. Tamar? Yes, do you hear me? Martin, do you, yeah, also, I do. Do you also? Okay, all right. So I'm Tamar Julia from the IACPM, the Association from Great Portfolio Managers. And I wanted to raise the following question. You have, you personally, have the challenging role to overview regulations across financial services. And we know that in the current situation, we need to incentivize for more resharing between financial services, between banks, insurers, and investors. We also know that we need to do that for to develop the capital market union, that we need to do that also for sustainable finance lending growth. And despite that, the Basel free finalization, and I understand, as you say, Martin, that Basel free is just one corner of the entire regulation. But as it is drafted now, it does not incentivize for resharing. I would even say it did incentivize for that because for the treatment that the various tools do have for resharing. And I don't like to raise the name securitization, but I would say resharing, whether they are with insurers with a, 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 a too high LGD, whether it, are, it is for the output flow. But forget about the technicalities. Do you think that barter free finalization should also incentivize for resharing? And if it is so, can we discuss about that? 
Well, uh, certainly, uh, uh, risk sharing, risk distribution is at uh, is at the heart of uh, you know the financial sector, uh, uh, and and we need to make sure that uh, this can uh, uh, work uh, in uh, in practice. And uh, certainly, the rules play an important role in this respect. But we also need to pay attention to contagion risks um, between. Uh, between banks and also between uh, different sorts of uh, financial uh, institutions. And this is the delicate balance uh, that uh, uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, to make. Now, uh, one, uh, you know, uh, channel of uh, risk distribution clearly, as you mentioned, is uh, is securitization. Um, the, the 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 Basel Committee will be working on uh, on 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 this topic uh, uh, in the next uh, couple of uh, years. Um, uh, there will be discussions also in the trilogues on uh, on the matter, uh, and this will be opportunities to uh, to confirm whether or not uh, the current arrangements are are optimal. You know to uh, to strike this right balance between uh, between risk sharing and uh, 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 making sure that we avoid um, uh, spreading risks across the sector in a, in a manner which uh, might be uh, uh, might create uh, financial instability uh, so i we i do i do take your point but there is no easy solution on that huh? No, I just want to say to give you one information. Whatever is said in terms of securitization in Europe, synthetic securitization, which are transferring genuine credit risk, is growing. It is private transaction. It is growing. Whatever is happening on the public market, but it is growing. And I hope we'll be able to continue that. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Um, I think um, uh, you've been very generous. The, the view of the council uh, on the trilogue. So I'm uh, happy to welcome on the, on stage um, Eric Lentorp of the uh, Swedish Ministry of Finance and Gabriel Cumage of the uh, DG Trésor in France. So many thanks, uh, Gabriel and Eric, for being with us uh, this morning. Um, the French presidency worked hard on the Commission's proposal during uh, the first uh, half of 2022. Then the general approach was agreed under the Czech presidency, and it uh, inherited a lot from the, the consensus building uh, that happened during the French presidency. Now the trial of process is in the hands of uh, the Swedish uh, presidency. Uh, so um, maybe uh, Eric, uh, you, you you should be first uh, introducing the subject, and I I, I actually let you both uh, um, interact on uh, which topics you, you you want to 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 address and, and in which order. Well, as, as you wish. Um, thank you, Eric. But uh, I mean, I think I'll let Eric, who is the one really in charge right now. So we were, but we're not again. And um, I'll let you. Okay, then, then I start and I, and I will give a, a short talk. And uh, please feel free to jump in and correct me if I may say something wrong, yeah. <laughs> or uh, or we'll just take it from there. Hopefully, I cover most of the issues and fill in the blanks. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to take part. In this, uh, round table uh, first for me it's going to be interesting to see how the discussion goes i think it's very very uh, constructive to to start uh, to have this kind of round table at the start of uh, the trilogue where co-legislators and industry can meet and uh, discuss different perspectives uh, let me also mention a disclaimer uh, today i'm representing the presidency of the council so i'm not representing the swedish ministry of finance and I will not champion Swedish positions. 
Secondly, being in Paris and talking about the banking package, I must mention the exceptional work and progress made by the French presidency during the first half of 2022. Uh, that was also followed by another strong presidency by the Czechs, uh, who also landed the general approach. Uh, without the work of these presidencies, uh, we wouldn't be here today. And as the current or incumbent presidency, uh, we take it as a challenge to meet the high bar set by my French and Czech. As a first, first set of introductory remarks, uh, I need to mention briefly at least our general political priorities for our presidency, which are security and unity, competitiveness, meaning that the EU must uh, continue to provide the best possible conditions for a sound and open economy, green and energy transitions, and democratic values and rule of law. In addition, when it comes to financial services, we have also communicated that we will take forward the work on financial stability. Clearly, an international standard, like the Basel standard, relates to competitiveness. But the banking package also have bearing on supporting the green transition. And last but not least, the banking package obviously is about safeguarding financial stability. Against this backdrop, our aim is to reach a political agreement with Parliament. We'll hear from the Parliament then. What they have in mind. Uh, and then, of course, a uh, few words on the recent events in, in, U in the US and in Switzerland. Uh, while it may be too early to extract full lessons learned, as, as Martin also mentioned, uh, they show clearly how interlinked financial systems are. And with information traveling at light speed, financial turmoil can spread fast around the world, world and across different segments of the financial system. The events, the events uh, underline the benefits of international standards that aims to ensure not only a level playing field, but also resilient banks across all major jurisdictions. So while the Council agrees to a faithful implementation of the Basel Free Standard, we also have a clear mandate to ensure that there is no significant increase in, in overall capital requirements for the new banking system. And we likewise have a mandate to duly take into account EU specificities. The rationale behind the mandate is simply to make sure that banks can continue to provide services to the real economy. And this rationale is reinforced by the current challenging economic environment with high inflation and rising interest rates and in combination with the need to finance the green and digital transitions. But the Council also, perhaps implicitly, departs from the fact that the banking package concerns potential regulation and supervision. The rules should thus be about risk management, and we should keep the potential framework focused on risks and financial stability. The potential framework can, of course, be supportive of other objectives, but we should not tweak the framework beyond risk management to further other political goals, regardless how well-meaning the tensions are. I mentioned earlier the European specificities, heuristics, but what does that mean? If we look at the European Union from a bird's eye view, we can immediately see striking characteristics. The Union consists of 27 member states. The fact that the Council is made up of individual member states can also explain while the Council may typically have a stronger emphasis on the member state perspective. If you look at the EU economy, we have the single market. We also have several different currencies. Uh, perhaps needless to point out, one currency is more, much larger and more widespread than the others. Furthermore, the financial systems in the Union are bank-centric. Uh, many firms and households turn exclusively to the banks for financial services, maybe payments, savings, or borrowing. And of course, there are ongoing efforts uh, to increase capital market fund funding. But for now, and for a foreseeable future, banks are absolutely critical to funding the real economy. And if you consider the banking systems, we are member states with predominantly domestic banking systems, and we are members with cross-border banking systems. Among the later, we have home and host countries, depending on whether your system is dominated by domestic bank with foreign operations or foreign banks having subsidies or branches in your country. And now turn to the banking regulation, we have the single rule book, recall, 
in EU, in contrast to many other jurisdictions. We implement international standards for all banks, both small and large. We also have a banking union with centralized supervision and resolution for the most important banks. And again, not all members are part of the banking union. And although much work has been done on the banking union, it is still not complete. Of course, we can find similar trades in other jurisdictions uh, that also promise to implement the Basel standards. But the exact combination of characteristics that we have in the European Union are unique, and we need to cater for these. So consequently, in its general approach, the Council strikes a balance that respects the characteristics of the European banking market and the implementation of that the implementation of the Basel Free Standard should not result in detrimental effects to the European economy, while at the same time faithfully implementing the Basel Standard. Of course, to achieve this, trade-offs have been necessary. So I will now say a few words on specific issues. Let me start with the reason why we're here in the first place, the finalization of the Basel Free Standard. The Basel Free Standard gives us a more risk-sensitive, standardized approach, but it also introduces the output floor, effectively capping how much capital requirements can be lowered by, by internal models. So the output floor means that we lose some risk sensitivity, but we gain comparability and we reduce exposure to what we may call model risk. In sum, this will benefit the ability of banks to induce confidence, which will enhance the resilience. I think the last weeks have reminded us of the importance of confidence in banking. At the same time, implementing the Basel standard, and in particular the output floor in the EU, without properly taking into account the European Union characteristics, could result in a significant capital increase, which in turn could have a negative impact on the economy. The Council therefore provides for transitional provisions regarding unrated corporates and residential real estate. And this in order to provide sufficient time for marketplace to adapt towards the revised framework while ensuring that the BOS standard is faithfully implemented. Essentially, the Council accommodates for the current role of banks in the EU, for example, the fact that many firms rely on banks rather than markets for their funding, and that's thus not found the need to obtain credit ratings, at least so far. It is important to emphasize these provisions have been introduced to respect the characteristics of the EU banking sector rather than to forward specific policy goals. Let me then turn to the second issue. As mentioned previously, one EU characteristic is that we are a union with 27 member states. We have home and host countries and an incomplete banking union. Consequently, one key aspect for the Council is the home host balance. In order to ensure financial stability in the union, as well as financial stability in each member state, we have implemented, implemented out of at all levels of consolidation. This is fully and completely in line with the current rules on capital and liquidity, including the related waivers. It furthermore follows the logic of the CRR ever since it landed in the force. In this context, let me also mention the Eurogroup statement on the future of the banking union of 16 June 2022. I'm sure you know it, so I won't read it, but essentially it says that until a broader agreement on the completion of the banking union is reached, the home host balance cannot be changed. This is the Council's view. I mean, the Eurogroup statement is a testament to several years of discussing and debating this issue. And we cannot see why the current banking package, which is about implementing international standards for capital requirements, should be used to try to change the sequence of measures to complete the banking union. Another important topic in the Council's negotiations were the global competitiveness of the EU banking sector and the attractiveness of our market. In order to protect these objectives and to ensure that the EU have access to global financial services, the Council agreed that we should not introduce an exhaustive authorization requirement for third country branches. A stricter authorization process than for credit institutions, the council not find potentially required nor necessary from a single model perspective. A third topic is the issue of proportionality. The council attaches significant importance to proportionality, but we should also be careful. Proportionality is a concept with different dimensions. 
One aspect of proportionality is that the rules should provide for various sizes and complexities of different types of banks in a proportionate manner. This is important, not least considering that in the EU, we do implement international standards for all banks. Still, proportionality should not come at the expense of effective prudential supervision. In other areas, the Council found necessary to make amendments or proposed measures and procedures would only increase the administrative burden and cost for both banks and supervisors. This was the case for the fit and proper processes and the rules on potential relevant transactions. Another example is the rules on supervisor independence. They should remain proportionate and they should not restrict labor rights. It would be very worrying uh, from a financial stability perspective if supervisors would run into difficulties to employ staff. Finally, as mentioned before, the green transition is a priority of the Swedish presidency. Taking better account of ESG risks in the potential framework is an important element of the Council's general approach. However, we should take care and keep the potential framework focused on risks to financial stability also when it comes to ESG. To conclude, the Commission came a long way in achieving a proposal for implementing the Basel III standard that accounts for EU specificities and does not result in significant increase in overall capital requirements. The Commission's good work explains why the Parliament and the Council did not make substantial amendments on many topics. But based on the EU characteristics and to arrive at a well balanced compromise, the Council saw the need to make some important amendments, of which I mentioned some today. And I think yeah, I hand it over to Gabriel if you want to add. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And um, I won't, um, again, I'm going back to the disclaimer that uh, France is not holding the rotating presence anymore, and it's in your hands, you complete the trilogues. Um, I, won't, I won't go back to what you said, maybe um, just adding a few words, circling back to the general objectives of the CRR, CRD package. And there, I won't be faithful to what Pervon said in the introduction, that um, I think today um, we'll all try to focus on Battle 3, but we'll all be talking a lot about something else, um, in a way. Um, now, uh, maybe first point, I think, is that, um, and that's why I was mentioning CRR, CRD, which is that the Commission proposal and both uh, the Council and the Parliament seem to be uh, content with that political direction, is that it's not just finalizing Battle 3. And remembering that Battle 3 is definitely already implemented and enforced in the EU, uh, which maybe is not entirely the case uh, elsewhere. Um, and I think in the long run, probably um, some of the most important pieces of legislation um, in terms of impact for the way the banking sector and the financing of the real economy in Europe evolve are in matters that are not directly in the Basel Agreement, but in signals sent through the CRR, CRD package, and we'll see what the final text is, uh, on some, well, EU specificities. And notably, the ESG signal is something. It's a first, but it gives the general direction. Um, the question on the fit and proper, um, all that is in CRD, I would say, reconfigurating a little bit the way supervision is effectively enforced in the EU at EU level at, um, well, um, SSM level and uh, in each uh, member state is important also. In this regard, I mean, um, coming back to what uh, Martin said, um, well, yes, uh, the, SVB, um, the SVB case at this stage showed that quality and intensity of supervision matters. I think we're all quite confident in Europe that we're definitely ahead of other jurisdictions, uh, but uh, the CRR, CRD package does have uh, some some elements in it where we can make uh, make all the more progress. Um, second thing, second remark maybe as a complement to us, uh, what Eric said, is that yes, we've been um, working quite a lot. I mean, the Commission has been, and then um, and then the 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 the, the um, various presidencies. Um, dealing with what does significant impact or no significant uh, impact uh, in terms of capital requirements mean? Um, I would say, I mean, we haven't had uh, a, uh, in the Council, at least 
a quantitative discussion with modelization because that's not what colleges later do. But what's sure is that there will be, let's say, substantial requirements raising in the long run with the transition periods, and that's where they're definitely important with this package. And in this regard, to me, I mean, the uh, important fact is not at this stage in the process, it's maybe not the fact that on this or that point, the uh, council version versus the commission version versus the parliament version will raise a little bit more or a little bit less the requirements. Of course, it matters when you consider the specific line of business or the impact in terms of uh, of requirement for this or that um, or this or that line of activity for the banks. But overall, what will come out of the package is a substantial raise in the capital requirements, which we hope will stay, and so we're confident in the mandate of the council, <laughs> Within the within the political mandate that had been given by the uh, by the Ecofin Council and by the G20 of no significant impact, the significant meaning no significant uh, harm to the capacity of the banks to finance the real economy. Um, and in this regard, I think I mean uh, with the work done already, we can be confident that it will be substantial. Um, it will be reasonably measured, and it probably will be more in Europe than in the US. So that's where we'll need to focus on what the US do, but not, um, not uh, maybe um, align what we do to what they did, because uh, the question of competitiveness is not an online of business. So it leads me to the third, uh, third consideration maybe, which is coming to I mean, what the banks are for, financing the real economy. And there, uh, I think, regarding the um, capital requirements uh, impact, uh, the important question is not anymore to know if at the end of the day, with the final package, the European banks will be more or less resilient than they were before the package. The answer is they will be more resilient than they were before the package. And that's starting from a point where I mean, um, we should take the supervisors uh, at their other words. Uh, the European banking sector is much more strong and resilient than it was 10 years ago. Um, and it will be more resilient after the package. So the question is, how do we avoid that some specific measures in the package by accumulating themselves? And that's where the output flow, because it's a transverse, uh, it's a transverse measure. Um, does matter, um, lead to some, I would say, overkill that wasn't intended in terms of financing of the economy uh, in one regard or the other. And that's where um, I would I would uh, uh, I, I would say the word securitization. I mean, it's not um, it's not bad to say it. And I would beg to differ a little bit with uh, the answer Martin said, uh, mate, because, um, I mean, yes, it's a complicated matter, including because of the stigma inherited from the uh, global financial crisis. But uh, what's important when you look at risk sharing, um, to, 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 to take this word, or securitization, is numbers speak volume. And uh, in Europe, they speak no volume at all. Meaning, I mean, we have, we do have a situation today where the global, uh, the global regulatory framework does not enable securitization to be one way for banks to uh, to share risk and to better finance the economy in this regard. And that's where I think, I mean, uh, from our point of view, then taking a French hat, um, the the introduction by the Parliament of some. Um, some signal toward the fact that we should deal with uh, reviving a sound and safe securitization market in the future uh, is important because we have the CRR text right now uh, waiting for uh, the next uh, the next uh, legislature uh, will probably give us to 2025, 2026, I don't know when, so probably a little bit late compared to uh, the needs in terms of financing the green transition, notably. Um, maybe a fourth remark, um, but there I can be very quick, is just echoing what, uh, what uh, Eric said regarding, let's say, the banking union and the one side of the banking union, which is the homehost issue, as I see, Pervash, 
laughing because it's been what 20 years 30 years we've been talking about that but um i mean from the french point of view we have a lot of sympathy uh, to um to to the efforts uh, that are in the uh, in the text in the version of the european parliament regarding the level of consideration of consolidation or the um or maybe more nimble waiver uh, waiver granting at the same time we've been suffering quite a lot in a number of years uh, working within the Eurogroup framework to try and find a way to break the deadlock uh, on the banking union, and haven't I mean we haven't managed it um, you know, with the with colleagues, um, and we think for the CR study package we should go for pragmatism and hammer it out for good, have it implemented in Europe. And there is another track. We'll have time to come back to uh, the, the question of the home host balance. But definitely, I mean, what we what we 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 had as an experience as the as the uh, chair of the council last year is that what's in the council position is definitely uh, the only workable solution uh, right now uh, in terms of uh, home host balance and uh, and uh, um, and supervision again with uh, all all sympathy that uh, from the french point of view we have for the uh, um the position of the parliament last point maybe um is the question of what do the other major jurisdictions do and uh, of course the question is uh, the elephant in the room of the is the us like has already been said um I don't think we should be too confident that they will be able to to keep the timeline of 2025, and probably given their own uh, their own um, timing uh, to adopt legislation, if they don't put out a a, a, a proposal uh, by the summer, they won't be able to keep the uh, the 2025 deadline. Um, so at some point in uh, in time, maybe uh, one year from now, we'll have a question us Europeans and the Commission in uh, the CR CRD text has some tools to deal with that regarding um, notably market activities because that's where the main uh, thrust of the competition is. I mean, not everything, but it captures uh, uh, essentially um, the, the 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 direct impacts. Uh, we'll need to uh, we'll need to to see uh, what we do uh, in terms of adapting the rules so that there is some level of playing field kept. Um, I think that at this stage, it's definitely, it wouldn't be a good idea to say, okay, let's stall the process in Europe regarding the CR CRD package and wait and see what the US do. Because then first, I mean, knowing uh, ourselves, Europeans, you never know how it ends up. And right now, there is a good momentum for the trilogues to be concluded and for a tremendous piece of legislation to enter into force. And probably for banks, but also for companies, it's good to have some visibility regarding what's happening, all the more because of the turmoil on markets. So let's give uh, visibility on that, which doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't be nimble uh, when uh, adapt. I mean, when the need to adapt to what the other jurisdictions do arise. And I think. Um, yes, European legislation is very rigid because this is the way the law is made in Europe. Uh, that's because of our institutional setup. But I think that from what we've seen in the past one year and a half, two years maybe, we see some more evolution um, in being able to adapt and be more nimble uh, in the in this legislation. In this regard, the delegated act for the FRTB that is in the in the in the council proposal and given to the Commission is definitely, I think, one good tool to adapt. Uh, we've seen in other legislation like the MIGA regulation on crypto that we're able to be a little bit more nimble than we used to, and I think we should continue working on that, working uh, uh, on that, uh, on that front. So I'll stop there. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be as complementary as possible to to Eric, and um, we'll pro probably hand over the the floor to the other um, important legislator. I think, but Veronique, back to you for the yes. discussion. Thank you very much. So, as I explained at the beginning, we'll we'll have the discussion at the end of this uh, of this morning. So, uh, I will invite uh, Ronald Fernandez to to join the the floor and uh, present, react to uh, the Commission and Council proposal and present.
probably not because I'm having like this version. So, no need to introduce you, uh, Jonas. Thank you very much for being with us uh, uh, physically here in Paris today. Uh, you're the rapporteur of the um, of the package. There has been uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of amendments brought by the various MEPs and thousands, the, thousands, thousands, yes, thousands. thousands. And uh, and so it's been a hard work, I'm sure, to to to, to find uh, uh, the the a line. I would say in in um, in in the position of the Parliament. So um, the floor is yours to explain that process and 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 the state of play today and how you approach the the the, um, the, the upcoming trial of discussions okay so first good morning thank you thank you so much for the invitation and thank you Parvaz, uh, for your kind invitation to to be here with you uh, to talk on evolution of the trialogues uh, between the council and the parliament around the crr crd uh, I think that uh, the Commission and the Council uh, explained well uh, before me the situation of the negotiation and the different uh, points uh, that we will have to, to to solve in the in the negotiations. Yeah, uh, we uh, had our first uh, political trialogue two or three weeks uh, ago, uh, and from the Parliament side and also from the Council. Uh, we committed to finalize uh, the negotiation fast, uh, and I hope, as Merlin said, uh, before the summer break. Uh, it's true that there are many issues yet open. It's true that in our first political trialogue, we didn't enter in details. And until now, we just uh, decided what kind of uh, differences we still have to, to solve at technical level and which point will have to be debated at political level. Uh, but it's true that we only have one trialogue and the next one will be at the end of April, uh, mid, mid, mid of April. Uh, so I think that there is another trialogue in May and maybe two in June. Yeah, so let's see if we have time to finalize uh, before June. Uh, but in any case, our objective, as Merlin said, is to, to finalize the agreement before the summer uh, break. Um, maybe first, uh, a few general considerations. Yeah, maybe the first one is that even if we thought uh, some weeks ago that after the last 10 years where we improved so much uh, the regulatory framework on banking activities, uh, in the last two or three weeks, uh, we uh, realized that there is not the moment to, to reduce uh, the pressures or the supervision and the regulation willing on banking on banking sector. It's true that we didn't have any special problem in the European banking sector, uh, but in any case, uh, the risks uh, are around. And I think that the experience in the US in the last two weeks uh, remind us uh, that at least the principle of proportionality that we use it in many times for any other issues should be uh, reanalyzed. Yeah, because uh, if we decide or if we take this side, uh, many, um, many chains or many European specificities uh, taking into account the proportionality principle, uh, I only want to say that we need to be very prudent. Yeah. Other general remark is that the Council and, and the Commission said in the mandate to the Basel was that we didn't want a, a, a significant increase of the capital. Yeah. So the no significant increases is there is already in the proposal and of course in the Parliament 
test, uh, but no significant increase of capital, at least from my perspective, does not mean no increase on capital. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, significance is relevant in the in the principle. Um, and no significant uh, increase should be applied to the banking system as a whole, no entity by entity. Yeah, because what we try to do with the uh, implementation of the latest Basel recommendation, explicitly the output floor, is to increase the comparability among banks. And, and of course, in some cases, we will see some banks which will need more, more capital for sure. Yeah. So the no significant increase principle, at least from my perspective, does not mean no increased capital at all. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe after these general considerations, we can enter on, on details. Um, the, the Parliament thinks, as the Commission, that we need to apply the output floor at consolidated level solo. Uh, the Parliament thinks that this is the best way to uh, take another steps in the process of the banking union. Uh, and the ability for the banks to allocate capital and liquidity uh, with uh, more room for maneuver is welcome uh, from the Parliament side. Indeed, uh, we introduce also some capital and liquidity waivers in the regulations uh, that with the application of the output floor at consolidated level, I think that we will move uh, the, banking, the banking union. Uh, issue that we introduce some safeguards of this uh, general application of the output floor, and our safeguards are different from what the Commission uh, proposed. Uh, as you know, the Commission uh, proposed to apply a numerical system to allocate the capital uh, among uh, the member states. Uh, in the case of the European Parliament, uh, we we propose to two safeguards, as I said. One of them is, okay, even though at the beginning the application of the output floor will be a consolidated level solo, the Commission will have to prepare a, a report for 2027 about the evolution of the banking union, especially uh, or more concretely about the implementation of any kind of European deposit insurance framework. If uh, the Commission thinks that uh, in the next few years, we didn't advance so much in the banking union. The Commission will have the ability to propose the application, to change the application of the output floor in both levels. And apart from this uh, point, uh, in, our, in our model, any competent authority will have the ability to request, um, uh, to request uh, allocate more capital in their jurisdiction if the, the content authority thinks that uh, no, the application of the output floor at consolidated level solo could uh, reduce uh, the needed capital in their jurisdiction. Yeah? So in the state of the numerical uh, method uh, proposed by the Commission, uh, the Parliament thinks that uh, the, the conversation or the negotiations between competent authorities will be easier. And if there is not any kind of agreement, the European Banking Authority will have to intermediate uh, between the competent authorities. Yeah. So, uh, at least from the Parliament side, uh, we think that this um, this political framework, political in the sense that uh, we let uh, competent authorities negotiate uh, between them, uh, is uh, better than what the Commission uh, proposed. And, and I would like to to insist on on the necessity to publish the report uh, by the European Commission in 2027 to analyze the evolution of the banking union. Yeah, because uh, as uh, the Commission said uh, before me, it should that the application of the output floor at consolidated level solo could uh, reduce the impact on capital. And, and, and this is something that, of course, is also there. Uh, we think that this uh, this way to, to apply the output floor uh, is more consistent uh, with the banking union project. Yeah. So, and and I think that this will be a, a controversial point in the trial. Yeah. In our first in our first political trial, I think that there was only one 
clear thing. Uh, the council uh, thinks that uh, the output floor has to be applied in both level. Yeah? And as I said in the in the in the meeting uh, from the parliament side, we also think that we need to apply the output floor at consolidated level. So yeah, so um, we will have to discuss on this matter. We will have to to work to find an agreement uh, between us. But at least uh, to be clear, the, the the position of the parliament in this matter is is strong, and and we are united, yeah, among the different political groups on this on this point. So let's see what kind of agreement we are able to to achieve. Yeah. Um, there is another point related also with the application of the output floor. Uh, that, but it's, it's not exactly the same, but uh, as you know, the, the increment of the capital uh, due to the implementation of the output floor could create some distortions or maybe no distortion, but at least there will be a debate about the impact of the increment of the capital due to the implementation of the output floor with the systemic buffers yeah uh, this is another element that we will need to to debate in the in the trial of this is related with the directive not with the regulation but as as you know the the parliament does not want to net completely the the increment of the capital uh, due to the implementation of the output floor with the uh, buffers, with the systemic buffers, as the council of the council wants. Uh, second point: transitional transitional arrangements. Um, and the Parliament is aware uh, there are some European specificities; uh, they are there, uh, and uh, we shared with the Commission, but also with the Council, that we need to give time to the banking system to adapt to the new rules. Yeah? And an issue that our mortgage market and the unrated corporation corporation market, we have some specificities, some particularities in the European banking system. And we have to, to give time to the banks as I said to, to adapt themselves to the to the new rules. In any case, there there is a clear difference uh, on between the council approach and, and the parliament approach, and and I would like to to say that at least from my perspective, the parliament wants to establish a clear end date of these uh, transitional arrangements. Yeah, in the commission, in the commission and in the council uh, proposal, uh, these transitional arrangements are limited. But uh, the European Commission will have the, the power to enlarge these transitional arrangements. Uh, I don't know for how many time, how many years, maybe forever, or I don't know. Uh, in the in the Parliament, uh, we had a deep debate on this matter. Uh, some members uh, wanted to delete completely the transitional arrangements. Other members wanted to keep them uh, forever, as as you know. And the final agreement in the Parliament was that okay, the transitional arrangements will be there as uh, the Commission proposed. Uh, but if there is any kind of extension of the current uh, transitional arrangements, uh, the potential extension has to be limited. And and we introduce uh, a clear end date of, of the transitional arrangement. Yeah, and I think that as I said. We have to give time uh, to the banks to adapt to the new rules, but we cannot uh, introduce or we cannot keep in our regulatory framework uh, this kind of uh, basal deviations uh, forever. Yeah, because in that case, the deviation of our uh, regulations uh, will be will be very very high from what the Basel recommended. So we supported the transitional arrangement, but. Uh, we supported them with a clear end date that we introduced in our in our test. Uh, third, a more broadly some kind of uh, European specificities. Yeah, apart from the uh, European specificities that there are in the transitional arrangement, there are other European specificities in the in the regulation or, or 
clearly speaking Basel desviation yeah uh, in the in the parliament and also in the in the council and by the way in the commission so here there are some desviation as i say some of them are shared in in the three texts uh, there are others desviations which are alone in the council or in the parliament test yeah uh, honestly i i don't know what we will do with, with these desviations yeah let's see the, the negotiation in any case what we agreed uh, in our in our first political dialogue was that we will take note uh, of every desviation uh, that uh, we could agree uh, some of them are common in the Parliament and in the Council test, so in that case, we will not debate uh, in deep this desviation, given that both, both co-legislators uh, supported these desviations. There are other desviations supported just for the Council, other just for the Parliament, but in any case, we will take note of every desviation, of every potential desviation, even that desviations that are in the both text, as I said, at the beginning, at, at, at the end of the of the negotiations, uh, we will have to summarize uh, all of them, uh, and, and we will reanalyze them, all of them, even uh, the desviations, as I said, uh, that are in both texts, but we will reanalyze them, all of them, uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, we we need uh, a regulatory framework uh, in the scope of the Basel recommendation. Yeah, as I, I would like to remind you that at this moment we are not materially compliant with with Basel. It's true that we apply the same rules to every banks, and this could, and this creates some some problems in the implementation of Basel. Uh, the US. Um, don't have this problem because they apply the Basel recommendation just to the systemically and globally active banks, um, but uh, they have other problems. <laughs> uh, but our problems are that we want to apply the same rules to every banks. We need to adapt them, yeah, because it's true that the big and the smaller banks are not exactly the same. This adaptation force us to deviate from Basel in some elements, yeah. Uh, but uh, in any case, as I said, with all of the deviation that we have in the Parliament and in the Council test, uh, we will reanalyze them at the end of the negotiations, trying to to see the the real impact of the deviation that we have introduced, um, and, and and a reflection. Yeah, and, and we need a reflection, uh, trying to to see uh, how compliance uh, our regulation uh, will be. Fourth, um, in, in December, the, the Basel Committee unveiled its proposal uh, on crypto asset uh, prudential regulation. Uh, the, the Council uh, closed its general agreement or general approach in October, November, so the Council didn't have time to, to analyze properly the, the Basel recommendation on this matter. Uh, we uh, voted uh, our uh, proposal at the beginning of January, so we uh, didn't have uh, a lot of time to, to analyze well uh, what Basel recommended on this, on this matter. But in any case, we wanted to introduce a new chapter in the CRR on, on this matter. Uh, with the idea to force uh, a negotiation with the council on on, on crypto and uh, use the slot, no, the slot of the trialogue, to adapt also our uh, regulatory framework of this kind of of this kind of assets. So the the proposal that there is in the parliament test now is just a proposal. As I said, uh, we are aware that we need to combine the MICA implementation, the the Basel recommendation. So our our wording or the current wording that there is in the Parliament uh, proposal is not exactly what we would like to have at the end of the negotiation, but the chapter is there to, to analyze uh, better during the trialogues, the, as I said, the, the latest Basel recommendation on, on crypto. Uh, fifth, uh, ESG. Um, uh, as you know, on, on, on ESG, 
uh, the, the parliament uh, always uh, wants to do more than what the commission proposed, not only on this uh, package, in other, in other regulation, in other directives. And, and I think that we did it, yeah. Uh, first, we, we improved uh, the third pillar, yeah, with more transparency, uh, with more periodical and more informational transitional plans, uh, trying to let markets uh, know better what our banks uh, do. Uh, so I think that we, as I said, we increase the transparency to to, to drive the market's discipline uh, in the process of the of the green transition. In the second pillar, we also improve uh, the power of supervisors, yeah, to 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 analyze better the bank's balances and to give the power to the supervisors. To, to see if one bank or other needs more capital, if there are more risks in their balances, given that now the supervisor will have more information from what we proposed in pillar in pillar three. Um, and finally, in pillar in pillar one, uh, there there was a, a, a relevant debate in the parliament yeah, about what we should do in, in pillar one. Um, all of us in the in the parliament uh, believe uh, that uh, the prudential framework has to be risk based. That that's clear. There there is not any uh, debate on on this matter. Uh, the point is how we could internalize properly the climate risk in uh, in the banking activities. Yeah, because the the climate the link between climate risk and credit risk is there. The problem is that we don't have enough data to to, to internalize the risk in our models or in our uh, frameworks to to calibrate capital requirements. Yeah. So the point in the parliament was okay. Everybody knows that the climate risk impact on credit risk. The point is that we don't have enough data to to internalize properly. Um, so uh, what uh, we did is first we uh, uh, propose to advance the European Banking Authority report on this matter. We also advance the, the new legislative proposal from the Commission. Uh, uh, but finally, we also introduce some clarification on Pillar 1 uh, that I think that there will be useful. And, and first, uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, even now we are approving uh, regulations to to ban some activities to 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 reduce um, some activities related yeah with with the climate risk so in that cases the every banks will have to adapt the collateral value of their credit if they are subject to any kind of uh, of obsolescence Given, uh, given the green transition, yeah, and given the regulation that we passed in the framework of the green transition. So we didn't introduce directly capital requirements or special capital requirements to cover the climate risk in Pillar 1. We didn't do. Uh, but what we did is, okay, uh, given that there are some activities which for sure will disappear in the next five, 10 years, because the Parliament and the Council passed some regulations to, to ban some activities. Uh, the, the exposures of these activities in the bank's balances have to internalize the value of the collateral at the end of the period, which will be close to zero, yeah, because these activities will be banned. Uh, so this is the way to, to bridge uh, the differences in, in the committee. Yeah, as you know, there were some groups as my group who that wanted to impose directly capital requirements in Pillar 1. There were other groups who uh, were completely against of any kind of uh, any kind of change of, of Pillar 1, uh, but the agreement that we uh, achieve is that. Yeah, uh, so there will not be direct capital requirements, but the banks will have to internalize the collateral value of their assets if any of them are subject to, to the green transition in any way. And, and finally, two, uh, two last comments on, on the CRD. 
uh, fit and proper uh, and third country branches. Yeah. Uh, in 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 both uh, topics, uh, the parliament, uh, the parliament um, is aligned uh, with the commission. Yeah. And in both uh, topics, the council. Uh, deleted most of the most of the requirements or most of the uh, proposals uh, from the from the commission so in in fit and proper we we respect uh, the the principle proposed by the commission as i said we apply on this matter the principle of proportionality yeah because uh, we understood that uh, there were different banking models in the european union um, and and we didn't want to 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 force some some change in some um, banking sector in in the union, but keeping the principle, I think that we adapt all of the requirements to improve in any kind in any kind the, the quality and the professionalism of the uh, key holder uh, functions and also the members of the boards banks. And, and in the case of the third country regime, and even more as Merlin said before me, uh, we also uh, kept the the commission the commission proposal with some with some fine tuning change, uh, but in any case the parliament uh, supported uh, the commission. So this is this is more or less what we did. Uh, and I'll maybe try to, to summarize uh, the parliament is, is committed yeah, to, to finalize the, the negotiation in the next few months. Uh, we think that uh, supervisors and banks need time to, to implement the new rules to be ready in 2025. I think that we are, we are on time. Uh, as I said, given that we apply the same rules to every bank, uh, we need to adapt them. Uh, this is some, this is something that the US uh, don't do, um, and, and the progress of that we saw them in the last two weeks. Uh, so it's true that we need to to introduce some European specificities, and I think that they are there. Uh, but the European specificities should not should not mean uh, less capital forever yeah and, and this is something that at least i would like to be clear because even though the no significant increase of capital is there as i said at the beginning no significant increments does not mean no increment at all yeah um and honestly uh, i think that we need to to, to keep uh, our banking system stable and, and and, and well capitalized. This is something that we need to to do, even though other jurisdictions want want to do other things. Because this is another point that I would like to to to, to remind you: if the U.S., if Japan, if any other country wants to apply partly the Basel recommendations, they will suffer for doing this. Yeah, and we are seeing now what is happening in the US. Uh, if we have a stable and reliable and, and, and well capitalized European banking system, uh, this, is, uh, this is needed to guarantee that we will face uh, uh, a strong and sound economic growth. Yeah? So if independence of other jurisdictions wants to do, we need to have a well capitalized uh, European banking sector if we don't want to suffer the effects of crisis in other jurisdictions yeah so I don't share that we need to to be in a in a race to the bottom on this on this matter we need to to guarantee that our banking system is is safe uh, um, and that's all thank you so much thank you very much for us. Um, a lot of work has, uh, has been done and still uh, needs to be done during during trialogue in the next uh, few months. Um, it's time now to move to the um, uh, private sector panel. Um, unless, Pervon, you allow us to have maybe five minutes coffee break just to 
or, or, or do we go straight to the panel? <laughs> Uh, no, because copyright with the people online doesn't work. Doesn't work. Okay. So anyone <laughs> that urgently needs a coffee, maybe you can do it pretty, pretty discreetly. You need it, yeah. I need it uh, myself, and I will uh, welcome on on stage uh, the panelists for the next uh, panel, Jonas and Etienne, and the other two panelists are actually on the screen. Thank you very much, to Kevin and and Celia, for the for addressing the problem so excellent uh, excellent sure. work yeah. you should stick here no to the pardon désolé du passage Beautiful. Can you turn the screen so I can have a look there while I'm doing it? Just a little bit of roughly which I would have. Sorry? Don't talk to me. No, no, I won't touch anything. That's okay. Okay, so um, apologies for those online. We, we we needed a one and a half minute break. Get some coffee after a very intense presentations uh, by the Commission, Council, and Parliament. So now, if you can please go back to your seat. And we will start this, this panel with um, a short presentation by Jonas, um, who is Managing Economist at Copenhagen Economics. Uh, some of you may have been involved in uh, earlier studies that Copenhagen Economies have, uh, has developed also uh, uh, together with the European Banking Federation in the past. Uh, Copenhagen has done a lot of work on, uh, on Basel III. Um, uh, in the last uh, three, five years, I think we've introduced this uh, and most recently um, issued a report, uh, not so much to discuss the impact itself, but rather how the impact on capital for banks might translate into uh, an impact in uh, both pricing, volume of credits, and also behaviors uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, asset allocation, capital allocation across various types of banks and various types of portfolios. So we thought that this would be a great introduction for the um, industry uh, remark, the bank's remark. Jonas, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation uh, to come here today to present uh, some of the research we have done on the impact of uh, the final pass of free. So uh, as mentioned, we've been working with this topic for, for many years. I've done various impact assessments uh, of the different forms of the package throughout the years. And so we thought here um, at the end of, of this process, at least coming to the end, that we will present some uh, numbers that we, we uh, had from, um, where we've done on um, the impact of um, the Commission's proposal. So this is sort of the form that it was in um, around a year ago when the, when the Commission proposed uh, the package, and we more think that this impact assessment could also be valid even with the current changes that are that are on the table. Uh, so just uh, so yeah, exactly mentioned, it's uh, some figures on, on the impact on the banking market, but also more what kind of implications uh, could uh, this package have in terms of cost of capital, in terms of uh, funding of a different kind of customer groups, and also um, market dynamics on the European banking market, because we think this package might have some um, some effects there. Um, I could also just mention this is an impact assessment we have done ourselves. We have a a model covering the 80 largest uh, institutions in, in Europe. So there are a lot of smaller banks that are not included in this number. So just keep that in mind when we do uh, the, the impact. 
But if we start with uh, sort of overall uh, what we find in terms of impact, I think it's mentioned uh, around these 10%. And that's also what we find concretely looking at these 80 large banks in, in Europe. We find an increase in capital requirements of around 12% on average. But this is very important that this is sort of a recurring theme in my presentation. This is the average impact, and but not many institutions will see that average impact. So we have standard uh, banks on the standardized approach that will see an impact of around 4%. Then we have quite a big part of the market, which are RB banks, but now that actually will not be bound by the output form. And they will also not see a very big increase in capital requirements, around 5%, right? And we have some banks, our banks, that will be bound by the output form. And there we see a larger increase uh, of around uh, 17%. And even that large pocket of around uh, of banks that are bound by the input. Uh, Bound by the output flow, we see quite sort of a diverse uh, impact. And um, so that's sort of just the overview of the impact on, on capital requirements. So we also made an assessment who will be bound by the output flow, because this is very important for uh, the impact uh, for the different um, institutions. And we can see it varies a lot in different countries. So in some countries, quite a significant share of the market will be bound by the output flow. Uh, we have on, on average for, for EU, we found that around 60% of the banks in our portfolio or in our analysis will be bound by the output flow, but it varies quite a lot across different countries. So some countries will have uh, the vast majority will be bound, and in other countries, there are a lot of banks that are just, sort of just on the verge of being bound. Uh, so these numbers you could easily tell for just sort of small changes in uh, the regulation could mean that, for example, a large bank will be moved from not being bound to be bound by the output form. So in that sense, these numbers, they're sort of very volatile because many banks are just on the verge of being bound by the output form. But it's important whether, even though it might not change sort of the overall capital requirements very much, whether you're bound, bound or not, it's important because on a portfolio level, it can change capital requirements quite a lot, even though on a sort of consolidated level that you're just on the, on the verge of being bound. Oh, there we go. And so far. <laughs> we also made an assessment and looking at the entire uh, banking market. What is the distribution of impact? And here we're getting closer to the point I made earlier that the average impact of 12%, it's not very representative for many banks how they will be affected by, um, by the package. So we have actually some banks, around 5% in um, among the institutions that we analyzed, that was yet the decline in capital requirements with this package. And that's because there are some relief to uh, the standardized approach um, risk rates for for, um, for residential exposures um, are actually uh, lower with this current package. So some banks on the standardized approach will decline. Then we have a big group of banks, uh, almost uh, half of the market that won't see any significant changes to capital requirements we find. So almost yeah, so half of, of, of the banks uh, will not really experience any increase in capital requirements. Then we have another group around a quarter of the bank that will see some increase in capital requirements between 10 and 20 percent. And then we have a quarter of the banks that will see an increase in capital requirements of about 20 percent. And even here we have some, but actually some quite strong increases in capital requirements, right? Starting to see a picture, the majority of the banks will see small increases in capital requirements, moderate increases, and then a few banks will see some quite significant increases in capital requirements. And here we're getting into sort of the need of it, what I'm talking about. This could have some effects on the competitive and market dynamics on the European banking markets, because we see some shift in capital costs uh, for the different institutions competing, of course, and, and servicing the same kind of, uh, of clients. You want to ask, excuse me, one, uh, one uh, question. This is in number of banks, right? Not in the not in the share of the market or share. Yeah. Really so, so the, uh, yes, I think it's a, of a total asset, right? So okay. if you have, uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, so if you have a bank that has a very large exposure, uh, they will they will uh, they will count uh, more sort of weighted with total assets, basically. You can say that a quarter of the uh, banking yeah, and, and exactly. And, 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 this this uh, increase. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. 
And by the way, the slides will be made available. So uh, I see some of you making pictures. Uh, we'll get the, the PDF version, which will be easier, I guess. And we also publish the white paper. All the figures are, are there. I think we can also maybe include a to that. Yeah, five yeah, pages, so it's an easy read. Um, looking at which kind of portfolios that will be impacted the most, uh, as mentioned earlier, it is the corporate portfolio where we by far see the largest impact. As you mentioned, this is for uh, mortgages only uh, because we made another assessment looking at the mortgage portfolio. So here sort of the total is a little bit higher. It's 18 then because that's on average what we see of increase in, in the mortgage portfolio. And here so we see that the corporate portfolio is far the most uh, effective. And that's simply by design of the package that, as mentioned earlier, there was this relief in risk rates for uh, residential mortgages. But that's not the case for, for corporate uh, mortgages. So we far see the biggest increase for, for corporates. And that, of course, begs some questions. How will that change the funding of these um, um, for, for corporate portfolios? Will some corporates start to look for alternative sources of funding if they see their capital requirements and maybe potentially also their capital and cross, uh, capital cost increase with, uh, with 40%? Uh, the people so all that I present so far is fully loaded so there's no transitional arrangement in it and in particular for the mortgage portfolio uh, transitional arrangement uh, big impact it makes quite a big uh, difference and um, then you can always argue which extent I mean I guess the transitional arrangement it gives financial institution time to adapt uh, to the new rule, but also at least we saw that with the, with the, the previous um, pre uh, package that the markets uh, expect bank to be compliant quite fast that's been um, agreed. So in that sense, I think the market and also internally, you have a look at the final capital requirements quite early on in the, in the transition period. Uh, To sort of dive more into which kind of implication could this have, we assessed uh, what uh, what the capital cost could be for the corporate portfolio, which is most impacted for banks being bound by the outperform. So this is only banks being bound by the outperform. So uh, over around half the banks on average. Uh, and looking at the portfolio that is going to be affected the most. This is by no means an, an figure or an assessment of what happens to sort of average, average capital cost. But this is by the most affected portfolio by the most affected banks, right? So the point is here to say what kind of sort of diverse impact could, could this have. And here we can see our banks that are being buying the outflow. We will see or we can see a quite strong increase in capital cost for these banks servicing corporate clients. So we have on average here, an increase in, in capital cost of these banks of 27 um, basis points. Uh, so sort of a quite um, significant um, impact. Again, these banks here being bound by the fall will have to compete against some other banks that might not be bound by the fall. So this is begs the question, what will happen for these institutions? Are they going to pass on these capital costs to, um, uh, to, to their customers? I'm not too sure. So another way of looking at it, this is an illustrative example. You can have situations with the package that two banks operating on the same market. One will not see any increase in capital requirement for the corporate portfolio, where the other bank operating on the same market being bound by the upper four will see an increase in capital requirements for the corporate portfolio of around, uh, in this example here, 60%. So as an example, but it's sort of inspired for what we actually see on the markets. Again, it's a question. This bank B here, will they actually pass on these higher capital costs for corporates to the customers? I'm not sure, but then it means how can they then sort of get a return on equity that they would earn? I think they will. This will uh, imply some some interesting uh, market dynamics once this package is uh, is good. So my last slide and also a, a conclusion on some of the uh, on the implications in this package should have. I think it was discussed very early on that this package, because of the output flaw, will somewhat uh, weaken uh, the link between underlying risk and capital requirements. I think that's been discussed a lot the past uh, couple of years. 
when you down by the alpha four, you're not sensitive to changes in probability of default. So probability of default can go up. It does impact your capital requirements. So you weaken the link between underlying risk and capital requirements. The point of this presentation that I have today is not only is that uh, link being weakened, but also the link between capital requirements and how capital cost, I think, will be weakened with this uh, package because some of these large increases in capital requirements for some very specific portfolios by some specific banks, they will not be able to pass on these capital costs. So you think you will start to see the European banking market where there will be less alignment between capital requirements and the actual capital cost being passed on to, um, to customers. Yeah. Yeah, in, the, in your previous slides, and you put, yeah, the bank A that is not allowed by the output floor is a bank that use standardized models, standardized approach. Uh, not necessarily, it could also be an RB bank. Um, actually, that is the case here. It is an RB bank because you can see the, the risk rates are at a level that would only apply for, for an, an IRB. Um, so, but it could be, for example, that. Bank A has a large uh, mortgage, uh, residential mortgage portfolio that I see a relief in capital requirements. So on a con consolidated level, this bank e A here won't be um, impacted by the output form. And then paradoxically, because Bank A here has a large retail portfolio, they will have lower capital costs serving corporate clients. Any other questions to my um, presentation? Yes, it, it, it's not a question, it's just a remark about what you have just said, because mm -hmm. it explains the different, well, one of the difference between European banks and American banks. Uh, American banks have more uh, higher risk density in the uh, uh, sheet because they can uh, securitize or uh, the low risk uh, loans, for instance, mortgage loans, or they can transfer them to uh, public uh, structure like Fannie Mae, uh, Ginny Mae, or, or Freddie Mac. And, and so, uh, for that reason, the impact of the output floor is, is lower because the, the mix of the risk in the balance sheet uh, leads to, uh, in average, a higher. Uh, a higher mean, I mean, a, a higher risk density, and so it why uh, in, in fact this is not going to improve the comparability of risk. Uh, it's exactly the contrary. It will, it will conceal uh, a significant part of the risks, and it is why we, we can see uh, this, this kind. Of, uh, what, what happened now in, in the US, you, you have banks uh, with very high risks, but which are not really measured. Yeah, at least on the, um, on the probability of default side, if you're bound out to fall, which we found in our sample, like 60% of the banks were, uh, that they will sort of lose sensitivity to probability of default, right? They will still give sensitivity to um, Loan value, so leverage of the customer, right? Because there is some built in uh, sensitivity to that, and a standardized approach. So, there you will solve sort of sensitivity, right? But, but if you're bound to outperform, I, I agree with you that the probability of default will not um, be, a, be a factor anymore. So, that also means sort of what, what kind of risk will uh, institutions navigate, look towards. I think we'll see a skew that they will look less at probability of default, that they will look more into loan value. That's going to be a much more sort of dominating uh, risk factor for capital requirements. And of course, that would also speak the, the behavior of financial institutions when they look at what kind of risk should we be aware of. And, and for instance, if you issue a European group with a, a large retail banking activity and with low risk mortgage loans, the paradox is that you could double the risk on, on these mortgages without any impact on capital requirement. Um, if they are, yeah, to some at least if they are bound by the number four and on, on the PE yeah. risk, um, 
yeah. So it's it's very paradoxical. So it's uh, uh, it incentivizes as a, uh, well, the bank to take more risk. Okay, we we come to to further questions. I think uh, after after uh, after the rest of the of the panel. But thank you very much, uh, Jonas, to provide some uh, some uh, quantitative quantitative analysis, uh, uh, which which is, uh, I think putting these uh, these things into context in terms of uh, not really you know uh, how to change anything in the package because I think the output flow is there to stay and there's a debate about that, but more in terms of how banks. Should Think about it and prepare for 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 um, for quite significant uh, competitiveness issues, uh, not only with the U.S., which has been discussed a lot, but also within Europe uh, and even within a, a given country, depending on the business models of the various players. Which is something that is uh, I would encourage everybody to read the, the report um, because it goes, uh, of course, uh, a bit uh, further in in details and really uh, interesting. Um, moving to Etienne. And so Etienne, uh, as the Deputy Director General of the SBF, uh, uh, the French banks have been quite vocal, I think, during the, the whole uh, process uh, since already the, the discussion in Basel. Uh, so um, uh, how you, would you assess the current situation? Uh, has there, there been progress achieved uh, in the in the Council and Parliament of proposals compared to the initial Commission text? And, uh, what are the remaining priorities for you uh, and for the French banks? Well, well, thank you, Veronica. I think that Jonas uh, illustrated quite well why French banks have uh, been quite vocal, because there are more in the situation of Bank B than the situation of Bank A. Uh, that you just described. I, I, I will concentrate uh, here um, my speech on very three uh, focus topics because we have a lot of topics where we are concerned. But uh, as a lot uh, has been said already, uh, I will speak about uh, perhaps the output flow, the level of application of output flow, risk sharing. Uh, of securitization, I don't know if there is a now politically correct, correct word to address that. And something which has been said by you, Jonas, it's a fit and proper, uh, which I think it's also a good illustration of what is at stake. Um, first, on the output floor, um, I think that this is really key, in fact, in the discussion, because here, we have something that if we compare the situation of the banking industry to whatever other industry in Europe, we would ask ourselves, why uh, are we putting so many players here in a specific sector? If I take uh, the car, uh, the automotive industry, no one would say uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, well, we have to have a minimum level of inventories for the plant of our car producer, this Volkswagen. But here uh, in the Czech Republic, we have to have uh, just a local view of how the industrial process is done. And for the banking industry, we are establishing these kind of barriers. And when we look at uh, the international situation, I'm very surprised that we are advocating to have a strong and powerful uh, Europe competitors in uh, uh, areas of the future, like uh, new technologies, like uh, electricity, uh, like, um, uh, I said, car industry. And we are not achieving that for our banking industry, which is really a key industry to finance uh, the economy. So here, we are very strongly advocating at French level to have a consolidated view. We are very happy that uh, the European Parliament, that the Commission took this step to say, we have to put forward consolidated view if we want to make forward movers on capital market union, on banking union, it is key that we are not having a backwards here on the output floor. So second, it's about securitization. 
Uh, I've heard a lot about uh, uh, the increasing the robustness of the sector, increasing uh, every item to make sure that banks are more and more resilient. But in order to finance properly all that we have forward, we have to get some levers, and securitization is one of those levers. And I was a bit confused about uh, the exchanges that took place here, which very much on uh, uh, the very cautious, very careful even about securitization. I think securitization will be key if, uh, for instance, we want to develop in Europe the proper industrial base to compete with other continents like the United States. When we see the Inflation Reduction Act and the, its consequences. We have seen very strong uh, response from the European Union, even if we would uh, uh, have liked an even stronger one, but we have seen response in order to foster a uh, strong industrial base in Europe. And here we have to finance it and sequestration will be key to achieve that. The third point about fit and proper, it's for me a good illustration of what good intention can, uh, uh, can trigger if it's really followed by proper uh, tools. As French banks, we support naturally uh, fit and proper fit and proper rules that are needed uh, for, for the banking sector. But I don't see why uh, having uh, uh, purely ex ante, for instance, uh, scrutinization would ensure a better system than what is today here. And I don't want uh, a system to be very uh, harmful for um, banks that haven't proven uh, with any failure on this uh, aspect. Uh, to be very transparent, I haven't seen in the current crisis any problem fit and proper that would have been solved with new regulations. So the, just to finish as a conclusion, I would say that all those topics are, are not a core for the industry and for the banking industry itself. I'm confident that we will adapt to whatever rules will be given to us um, by the past, those adaptations, and we've proved that we are able to adapt. It's a call for the real economy in Europe. That is, if we want that this European real economy, this proper finance, we have to strike good balance between robustness and financing, and I think that there is no um, adequacy to uh, move this balance uh, if uh, we see what is at stake now. So that, that would be my three points. Thank you very much, Etienne. Um, we will move now to um, Christian Castro as soon as he appears on the screen again. Thank you, Celia. Christian is the head of public affairs at uh, Caixa Bank, uh, so a uh, Spanish bank uh, who is, uh, has been growing quite significantly recently and is uh, competing, competing also in the Spanish market with two uh, major GSIPs. So I don't know, Christian, whether you are a bank A or a bank B and, and, and what is your competitive uh, position in this uh, coconut economics uh, framework. But uh, in any case, uh, as also, I should say, uh, the next uh, Bank of Spain uh, official and, uh, and, um, and participant in the Basel uh, discussions uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that role, um, your view on uh, where, we think, where we are now is uh, quite, uh, quite welcome. Do you think that this package is converging uh, toward uh, the right balance in terms of risk sensitivity and, uh, and specificities? Uh, and um, also, uh, what do you think about the the, the implementation timeline uh, and the potential uh, bottlenecks? Yes, um, thank you, Veronique. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, yes, uh, 
I think that on, on, on the puzzle framework, a lot has been discussed on this convergence in the European implementation to, to, to the Basel Agreement, uh, national specificity, some issues. I think that I think that the key hot issues are well identified and well known by everybody. It was very useful, some of the new quantitative insights that were presented at the beginning. So I just wanted to, to make two comments on some aspect that I think are sometimes not considered that well during all this process. And as you mentioned, what the one is on implementation. You think in the puzzle, in the puzzle procedures, you, what you have is a quantitative impact study, a lot of analysis, discussion among countries, and until you get a, a proposal, not the, the, the agreement. Uh, then this is released, this is published, and countries have to implement these standards. And after a while, you have what is called a recap process, that is the regulatory consistency assessment program, where all the uh, implemented implemented uh, frameworks in different jurisdictions are assessed, and they are like a kind of uh, evaluation if they are uh, have been implemented faithfully with the with the Basel Accord, with the Basel Agreement. So it's like a monitoring on implementation. Um, but what I think is missing is something in the middle of these two process because it is previous to the agreement and post agreement. In the middle, during the discussion, I think that there are, uh, there are not a proper consideration to the differences in the implementation procedures across countries. And this is something that what we are seeing now. For example, the implementation procedure in the US is quite different to the United States. It is partially reflecting the difference between the, diff the, the true banking system and the difference that we have in Europe among different different countries and different banks, and it all gets you into the proportionality of how you implement these, these standards. But even without getting on that, I think that during the, uh, the Basel process, these differences on, on how the issues are going to be implemented and all the difference in the process would be good to take into account uh, in order to to make the whole process more efficient and realistic. Um, one other, th the second thought I, ha I, I had was uh, during this review of the implementation process, what you review is basically if the standards are consistent with the, with the agreement at Basel. But what I don't think that it is so uh, assessed or even uh, evaluated is the scope of implementation, the scope to which banks uh, this the Basel framework is uh, affecting or is being implemented. Uh, this is something logical because the Basel framework has been thought for uh, international active banks, okay? But we know that in Europe it's applied to all banks. So, um, but the recent event in the US is showing that uh, the coverage is not the same. So uh, I think that this is an interesting angle because at the end of the day, what you want to implement Basel is not because of Basel itself, but because you want to implement something that contributes to a more stable and more and safer financial system. So if you identify their gaps or you identify that there are a broad range of um, banks that are not uh, reached by the standards or that they are living under a different standard, what you could, may well end up with a less stable financial system. So I think that the scope of implementation is something that should be uh, regarded uh, or considered uh, during the Basel discussions. Um, and finally, uh, well, I have other point on, on uh, it's a related one because uh, so during the European discussion has been some discussion on how to implement a new element of macroprudential policy. Um, I think that it is, this is something important, but I don't think that all the options on the table have been considered. This in compass or this entails the counter cyclical capital buffer. There are some uh, under discussions and options to make uh, to, to facilitate the usage of the counter cyclical capital buffers. I think that there are many options where you can achieve this. There are some on the table that is called the positive neutral rate that you basically can use the counter cyclical capital buffer even when you don't have signs of excessive credit uh, growth at a system-wide level. Uh, but there are also other ways to achieve that. For example, it could be to, to making the capital conservation releasable. 
uh, just one example, but there are many others. So I think that it would be good to to have, a, let's say, a more careful study uh, or approach, more comprehensive to try to to include different options and not just just one. Um, that's pretty much the three points I wanted to make, Veronique. I think we lost contact. Hi. Uh, I can, I can hear you, Christian. Okay. Can, can you hear yeah. me? Yes, I, I can. Yes. I can. Hi, John. Hey. Hi. <laughs> But they can, I, I lost. Uh, yeah. There is, yeah. No. Yes, no. Hi, Veronica. I can see you again. <laughs> it's a bad line. Yes. I can see. I cannot hear you. It's Sorry, was it? I was just saying that uh, the, the connection is back. Uh, you were you were you were starting to talk about macro credential. Ah, okay. So if you could start all over again, I don't know. Yes, on, on macro proof. It's just just yes, yes just two words on that. Uh, can you hear me well now? Okay. I can. Perfect. Perfect. So very, very quickly, um, on the micro proof, uh, ever, most of the people there in the room uh, connected may know there are some discussion to include some new element or macro prudential instrument uh, in the ongoing revision of the CRR on the, the Basel framework. That's, that's include uh, some uh, approaches to facilitate uh, the usability of the counter cyclical capital buffer. Uh, and that approach has been used and applied in different countries and it's called the positive and neutral rate for the counter cyclical capital buffer. That's implied that you can put the counter cyclical capital buffer on a positive rate, even without you don't have an indication of excessive credit growth at the system wide level. Okay. For example, the trade to GDP gap, that is the leading indicator, is not saying nothing and you can increase for different reasons the counter cyclical capital buffer. For example, in prevention to an exhaustion of shock not related with credit growth. What my, my point is that I think it's a little bit too to rush a little bit more, uh, uh, perhaps uh, to rush too far at this point to include just one approach, one option that would be this one and not to consider other potential options, for example, to make more buffers releasable. Right now, the capital conservation buffer <laughs> is fixed and it could be done, it could be done releasable. And I think we, you are going to get a similar, a similar result to the purpose intended. So bottom line, my, my comment was, or my view, opinion, was that we need more time to assess uh, different options on the macro potential uh, on the new macro potential instruments that are uh, well sorry on the macro potential initiatives and policy changes that want to be introduced under the current revision uh, to assess a broader range of options and not just one one approach that's thank you thank you very much christian you. um moving to johanna Johanna, can you put your camera on? Yes, I think I, I yes. have the camera on. At least it looks, <laughs> to me, it looks like yes, I have it. We, can you hear we, me we, all we right? Can, we can see you now. We can see you okay, now. Perfect. Great. <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you all for, for very good uh, comments. Uh, I'll pick up on some of the things that Jonas said and some of the things that uh, Christian said. Um, I mean, uh, regarding the, the sort of heading for the overall uh, seminar or conference, uh, what's at stake for the moment? Uh, I also want to to uh, come back to 
uh, Jonas's points about the transitional arrangements for the implementation of the output score as decided by the Council and how crucial uh, those uh, are. And um, having, of course, the uh, perspective of, of the Nordics uh, where risk weights are on the lower side because of low historical losses. Um, what we have seen now on these transitional arrangements, uh, additional transitional arrangements that were uh, initially proposed by the Commission is that the European Parliament and Council are sort of coming closer and closer uh, together or closer and closer to each other in terms of um, what they are proposing on these uh, these additional transitional arrangements. Um, but uh, there is one in particular, and Jonas mentioned that as well, uh, and, and that's the one on uh, corporates that don't have an external rating, where uh, from uh, an SCB perspective, and I think this goes also for, for other Swedish banks and possibly also other banks in the, in the Nordics, maybe also German banks, etc., <clears throat> we are still uh, concerned about what the European Parliament proposes in terms of the uh, increase of the risk weights in the standardised approach from 65% to 70% for the last two years of this transitional period. And I mean, this may seem pretty undramatic if you look at it. It's an increase from, from uh, 65 to 70 <laughs> and then have a floor applied on that. So you end up somewhere uh, on average around uh, uh, an average risk weight of 50% if you need to apply this. But it's then again coming back to um, what will this drive in terms of bank behavior? And uh, Jonas was already onto that topic a little bit uh, by asking, OK, so uh, if if this uh, seemingly uh, undramatic uh, increase from 65 to 70 percent, if that leads to uh, banks being bound by the floor, what happens then? What will these banks do? Will they pass on the cost or uh, to those particular clients? Will they uh, do other things uh, in order to manage this increased uh, cost of uh, capital cost or the in increases in, in um, the capital that they need to allocate to these clients? Or will it be sort of spread out uh, more broadly over the entire um, client base or all, all of the lending that a bank does or all the activities. Um, so, so just to stress again that uh, to really to really uh, stress the importance of, of having um, the council solution in the end on this particular topic. I mean, there are a couple of, of things that could happen if banks would be bound already, say, in 2029 um, in, in those those areas of the EU where, uh, as Jonas was describing, where banks are maybe on the verge of being bound and this increase could be what tilts it over. So what could happen then? Well, I mean, it could have uh, several effects. First of all, in these countries, it could sort of hit quite broadly, actually, because um, for if you take Sweden as an example, we have not really had uh, on the books of the, the systemically important Swedish banks uh, credit losses to speak of since the 90s. So therefore, in the internal models, uh, credit uh, for credit risk, uh, the risk weights are on the lower sides. So this would hit broadly over the entire portfolio, you could say. So that's one problem in itself. Uh, and another uh, aspect is uh, that if you if you think that uh, until 2030, that sounds like a very long time that would give those banks if they are bound by the floor five to six years, maybe to adapt before this scenario kicks in. But five, five to six years in this context may not be so long, actually. Uh, if you look at how uh, lending to corporates actually works, you have the maturities of, say, two to five years. There may be reasons for companies, especially in uncertain times like these, to want to have longer maturities. Uh, if banks not do not know whether they uh, will be bound by the floor or if, if there is a risk that one will be bound by the floor, then uh, a bank will want to sort of 
take this into account already uh, at an early stage uh, and and then will be prone. It could drive behavior uh, such as, for example, offering shorter maturities and those corporate clients who then uh, still want to have long maturities because they want to be able to plan. They want to have uh, this as a as a measure of safety in their financing. Uh, they would then have to pay more for these uh, longer maturities because uh, it, it could be, for, from the perspective of the bank, there is an uncertainty on how much capital one would need to hold uh, nearing the end of this period. So five to six years may sound very, very long, but in this context of banks um, planning uh, and handling their risks, it's actually not uh, not that long. And then uh, there is a third aspect that I also wanted to make. Um, it's about the uh, how the different transitional arrangements uh, come together or the interplay between these, because as uh, you most of you most probably know, um, I, I take it that most are quite well informed on the different proposals uh, that are on the table. Uh, one of the transitional arrangements, the one for low risk mortgages, is a national option. And um, and and as uh, as uh, Jonas was already explaining in his uh, in his uh, I think it was his last slide with the two typical banks that he was comparing in his analysis. Um, there you you can see that a bank that is uh, an IRB bank that is not bound by the floor because it is diversified and because it counts on uh, the transitional arrangement on mortgages uh, being applied can feel safe uh, that it will have a certain distance to the output floor and that will also impact how it is able to service clients that are not mortgage clients. So in a way you could say that um, the, the countries that <clears throat> that uh, opt in for for the transitional arrangement <clears throat> for mortgages they that will also uh, have a positive effect on um, on the distance to the floor for the banks in that jurisdiction and will also then make it easier for those banks um, to service other clients than just the mortgage clients because it has an overall impact. So, so this is, of course, um, this is, of course, a little bit problematic, especially in those countries like, for example, uh, Sweden, possibly Germany, where uh, where we are seeing signs that this um, exemption uh, for mortgages may not be applied at national uh, level. Sorry, it's not an exemption; it's a tr the transitional uh, arrangement for mortgages may not be um, applied at national level. So these were some of the some of the concerns, uh, but um, still, I think uh, on a positive note, uh, the um, uh, the development uh, in terms of the two positions, the council position and the parliament position, is overall uh, positive and is overall going in the right direction. Uh, there are, of course, political tricky political issues. Um, one of the previous speakers already mentioned um, the uh, situation with uh, the home host uh, issues and the application of the floor at solo versus group level. Uh, this is, of course, uh, very interesting to follow and, and maybe one of the critical issues in the end. I think uh, I, I would also like to echo what uh, Christian said about um, how how we should look at uh, implementation of the Basel reforms at EU level um, in the light of the recent events. I mean, I think we're all glad uh, we have been uh, maybe not been so glad from the side of the banks in the past, but I think we are all glad now that uh, the EU applies um, applies uh, prudential rules has a, a principle uh, of applying prudential rules to all banks so that we do not end up in a similar situation as in the US where certain types of business models or uh, certain types of players are 
um, are exempt from global rules. Uh, but of course, it's about uh, striking a right balance because the rules are uh, the global rules are initially um, intended for for global players. So, so this could also. So uh, Hannah, uh, in the interest of time, I think this is a perfect conclusion for this panel. Uh, yes. Maybe we should we should move to the Q and A session. So, uh, maybe if I can ask Eric, um, Gabriel, and and Thomas. Come back on stage, and of course, questions can also be directed to the the private sector uh, participants. I remind everyone in the uh, online that uh, you can raise your hand if you want to ask questions. So, raise the. Michel, Michel has, has risen his hands one second before, and I guess. Steven. Can you stay there? Okay. Oh. We have everybody online. So, Michel. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, one word was not uh, mentioned today. That's okay. Uh, then we have uh, the keys to uh, um, when I uh, do uh, the agreement, the and here it's the area. Europe is in the stream. Because it's permanent. So my question is to try to be level. You think it's a little bigger? Respond. Eric, maybe Eric and then Jonas or the other way around. Yes, we're going to the side and then Gabriel could perhaps uh, add uh, from between. Uh, and then it can. To change the council commission proposal in this respect. So I, I leave it at that. Yeah. What else? No, I, I, on the day I have so, so much to add. Yeah, because on this matter, the position of the parliament is very close with the council also agreed. Uh, I take note on your request. Uh, of course, I think that I source the, the parliament will not let us uh, do that. Uh, in any case, uh, I am sure that we will come back on this matter and take the last thing to raise this point. There is no sound. Yeah.
Point. Very short. Very, it's, very short, please. Yeah, yes. It is about uh, should we apply uh, all these requirements if other jurisdictions do not yeah, do the same that, thing? That's something that we yeah. discussed, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, um, any further comment? I think uh, both the uh, output flow at consolidated level were discussed. Um, by, I don't know if anyone wants to add something. Uh, maybe on fit and proper, which was indeed uh, brought by, by Ronas, but maybe uh, uh, a reaction on the council side on fit and proper? Like on the council side, I mean, uh, basically, we, we don't think it's necessary to, to fix what ain't broken. Basically, the same seats. It's like an argument that I understood from, from, from the banking side. So, I mean, uh, the, the council does, uh, does a lot of amendments, kind of, uh, make sure that, I mean, we don't see the need for the harmless approach and the counter approach. So, so the, so the council uh, makes amendments to make it more like basically I mean, like, like it is today. Okay. Arnaud? Uh, very shortly, um, one question for Jonas. Uh, you mentioned the question of the climate data and the lack of data concerning the climate risk. Um, we are very concerned by the subject here in Paris and we have launched an initiative to try to work on that subject. It concerns all uh, the European issues of taxonomy in the CSRD, and uh, we would be interested to talk again with you about what must be done and must be organized on the European level uh, before uh, US data providers will take the control of data on the European level. My second issue uh, is uh, about uh, um, my, my um, my feeling is that one of the main messages of this uh, session this morning is um, that we cannot consider more uh, longer uh, Basel III without the question of the securitization on the European level. Uh, because we see that uh, the consequences of uh, Basel III on the subsidy financing for banks and uh, um, by that way, on the corporate finance, it will be very important. And uh, for me, it's one reason more to uh, take that uh, securitization. It's a very high priority, it must be a very high priority. And my last question is for all of you. Uh, you mentioned the question of the competitiveness and the way the European uh, Europe uh, is compared to other jurisdictions. In the US and the UK, how do you see today uh, the consequences of the uh, reduction act, the US reduction act on all of this uh, issue? Etienne Barrel has mentioned the point. Um, don't you consider that the, the IRA uh, put uh, another light uh, also on that subject? So, okay, the data, uh, yeah, yeah for us. No, I, first, no, I think that it's clear that climate risk is has a clear link with the banking risk in general. Yeah, uh, the physical risks are there, the transition risks also are there, and uh, we cannot deny that uh, the climate uh, the climate warning has a real impact on on the real economy and, by the way, on, on banking activities. Yeah. The point is that when we calibrate uh, our models or the standardized or the internal models, we always use an historical data, the data from the past. And, and the point is that now we need to calibrate models or we need to, to, to calculate capital requirements for something uh, that um, we don't have uh, previous data yeah, to calibrate well how we could internalize the risk in, in the regulatory framework. Uh, so what we did in the parliament was to advance uh, the European Banking Authority statement or recommendation study on this matter, and also to advance uh, a new legislative proposal on this, yeah, because we are aware that we need to do more. Uh, but what we did uh, just now was first increase market discipline, increasing the transparency through the pillar three. We increase the ability of supervisors to, to analyze properly 
the primary risk is the bank's balances, given that now they will have more information from the third pillar uh, disclosures elements that the parliament proposed. And finally, in pillar one, and as I said, given that we are not able to introduce us now in our models uh, the link between climate risk and credit or market risk, what we did was, okay, uh, during the next few years, uh, there will be some activities and maybe the sample is with a car, with the combustion cars. Yeah, now there was an agreement last week. But no, in theory, uh, from one date, uh, we will not be able to buy or sell combustion cars. So if you provide a loan to buy these kind of cars, the banks will have to internalize that at this date, when the, the ban will be entering force, the value of the collateral of this asset will be close to zero. Yeah, so this is only an example, but there were other activities, there were other type of uh, type of activities that will not be um, uh, will not be led in the in the future. Yeah, so what we did in pillar one was just one. This 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 uh, small thing that I think that there is a clear rationality behind this this proposal because, as I said, the the uh, prudential regulation has to be respected. The risk is there, we cannot toast, toast it, we cannot see it clearly, but the risk is there. And, and even though we expect new proposals, uh, we try to improve what we will do just now, uh, waiting for the proposal, yeah. Thank you. Maybe on the, um, on the, on the point of Arno, we cannot consider Basel three implementation without securitization, as there is a proposal on the parliament side. Commission uh, Marta Mama confirmed that this was uh, in, on their radar screen. As I would say at least maybe um, but the uncertainty comes more from the council side. So Eric, could you say a few words on this? Absolutely. And uh, I mean, from the from the council side, I mean during the negotiations, uh, we did the council didn't. But didn't consider that it was necessary to deal with, I mean, changes to the securitization framework during the implementation of the Basel III standard. Uh, I the council thinks it's a very important topic, it considers and it deserves consideration. And so, the uh, standard that should be uh, also a uh, due process uh, However, right, now the parliament has some intelligence uh, uh, in front of the uh, Discussions in and and it's so that at the end of the negotiations, uh, we agree that it's no change securitization. Yeah, I don't see so much room to increase uh, the Somehow, but what's happening on the 
the banking sector in the US or in Switzerland, that it's going to revive the whole debate. And second, on uh, uh, climate risk. I mean, we all know that uh, banking risk and climate risk are interconnected. And the question of the data for me is always an argument that is raised by people who don't want to jump into the, the jungle that I make say like this. So we, if we wait, we will wait too long. So uh, let's not wait until the end uh, when everything is solved by demonstration in real life, because then it, then it will be too late. But then this is the question of pillar one. And you can understand in dynamic that uh, even people who negotiated at the highest level of the Basel Agreement realized that it was already difficult to uh, oblige all stakeholders to swallow what was on the table in terms of capital flow. That if you added an additional uh, uh, floor for uh, uh, climate risk, then there would be a, a a row and nobody would follow the whole uh, issue. So how do you see the next step for real capital risk uh, uh, integration in Pillar 1? Uh, will there be, a, how, how do we call these uh, a final note in, in the regulation, a review clause on this? Or how do you see it? And what do you expect maybe from the Commission here? Okay, again, thank you. Should I start on, <laughs> on the climate? Uh, well, I think um, I agree, but I mean, I mean, as I understand it, fundamentally, there's no really no difference between Parliament and Council and Commission and then pretty much everybody else what we want to achieve. It's just more about data, as, as mentioned, and, and uh, I mean, it's also an, an area where you have, uh, I mean, the, the state of knowledge is also growing internationally on, on different standards and so forth. So, I mean, the, the council I, has a, then you might say, a more cautious approach than the parliament. I want to, to wait a little bit, hopefully not too late, of course, as I mentioned, that we have to see it on. on. So, I mean, but that was, I mean, the, the, the council view on, on these areas that we need to make sure that we, that we get this connection to risks to banks and financial stability risks before we put into the to the framework. But at the same time, I think it's happening a lot already in, in that direction uh, when it comes to the supervisory actions and how the supervisors and central bank, banks are acting and, and then seeing how we can implement this, this and stress this. So I think a lot of things happening. So I think that's also behind the council's view that we should give it a little bit of time and then we can see what, what, what the state of art is. Thank yep. you. So we move to the concluding remarks, maybe in the reverse orders of uh, speaking. If I, uh, so maybe starting with Johanna. Can you hear us? Yes, <clears throat> I can hear you. Yeah, no, but I think uh, this was a very, very short uh, one yeah. sorry. Very short one minute. Uh, yes. Speech, yes. Right? So that we. It's a very up. interesting debate, and especially in the light of uh, the current. Uh, developments. Uh, and I just want to, I, I keep repeating myself about the unrated corporates, but you know, in this, uh, in this new environment that we have with a lot of turbulence, the alternatives for, for the European corporate sector to go to the uh, bond market or turn to and uh, non bank financial institutions would not be a better option. So please think about that. That's uh, my final comment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Johanna, and thank you for being with us today. Christian? Sorry, I yeah. just wanted to agree with uh, Johanna. Very nice debate, very nice, very big point. I think that it is uh, something that we need to complete uh, rather soon, but completely well to ensure financial stability. So I repeat on myself again, uh, perhaps for the future to take into account more implementation issues across countries. Okay. Etienne? Perhaps uh, to, to underline the fact that uh, we must keep a risk-based approach. It's uh, the case for ESG, it has just been mentioned, but, but also to analyze uh, uh, the current situation. Let's not be emotional, let's be very factual. What has to be changed, but what is not linked at all with the current regulation. Thank you, Etienne.
Jonas? Yes, so I think I'll repeat my, my main message also for my presentation that I think this debate in the beginning focusing a lot on sort of the overall impact on the banking sector. And I think while we reach a level where this package is on an average manageable, so I think now the, the challenge is really on a very granular level. We are talking about specific institutions and specific portfolios. And there I think we still need to implement in a way where we make sure that it provides um, benefits for, for the real economy. Thank you, Jonas. Jonas? Uh, <laughs> No, not so much to, to add. Maybe uh, in the last uh, remarks uh, by Pervance, uh, on, on credit risk, as I said, what I think that the Parliament was more ambitious than what the Commission proposed. We even introduced some change in Pillar 1 uh, with the adaptation of the collateral value of the assets. Uh, if we uh, were not more ambitious of Pillar 1, uh, and you know perfectly the Parliament, uh, was due uh, we don't have more members in the in the committee yeah so there were some red lines in the negotiations and i think that given the red lines we were able to advance in any case from what the commission proposed and from what the council also agreed uh, in any case we expect uh, a legislative proposal uh, from the commission on this matter and europe is not waiting for Basel. To, to do more on climate risk. Yeah, so uh, indeed what we did with this proposal is much more what the Basel uh, thinks, uh, and we cannot wait for Basel to, to regulate better the, the climate risk. Yeah, the point is that we were not able, as you know, to, to, to introduce directly capital requirements on, on Pillar 1 because uh, there was not enough majority to, to adapt our models. And I have to recognize that uh, at this state, as I said at the beginning, is not easy, yeah? at least from legislators to to, add, to to introduce the change in the models in level in level one. Uh, maybe try to summarize uh, the implementation of Basel will not uh, significance uh, significant increase of capitals, but there will be more capital. So that's that's clear, and this is one of the objectives of the reform. If we try to introduce an output floor in the internal uh, models, it's because we want more capital. Yeah, and, and the point is that uh, the increase of the capital is not uh, homogeneous. Uh, no, there is not an homogeneous distribution. Someone uh, different uh, bank banking entities. There will have some banks with more. Um, impact than, than others, but uh, the general impact of the Basel three, Basel four is is not significant. Yeah, as we as we saw in the in the slides. Um, and that's all. And thank you so much for important. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, thank you very much. I, I think I'll I'll start from where Honas uh, what he said regarding we we did not wait for Basel and. It's, my remark would be that, of course, as a member state, I just hope for our Swedish colleague to work well with our partner and that we would have uh, we would have the final last package before the end of the Swedish presidency. Nothing against the Spanish presidency, of course, but um, time is of the essence, and uh, we definitely need to put this issue of the uh, CRR CRD package behind us. Because as we see it from the from the French Treasury point of view, point of view I mean, um, there will be a, a window opening uh, sometime this year, where it will be the end of the mandate of the Commission. The European Parliament will plunge into the election, meaning that legislative activity will probably start again only sometime end of 2024, rather uh, sometime beginning of 2025, and it's quite a long time from now. Typically, it's almost in the markets, and the change in the in the monetary policy and the macro policy will definitely put us in different worlds two years from now than when we are now. So, um, we really see merit into analyzing this battle three package. I mean, it will be compromised within Europe, right? So, um, then having some visibility there will uh, be able to focus on new prospective issues where probably we will not wait for Basel or whatever uh, international committee to come out with solutions. We will have very European-specific challenges, meaning notably the strategic autonomy. I mean, the uh, French from this point of view, but uh, reminding that the banking and financial sector is not just financing the real economy, but it's also uh, an industry for itself. 
Uh, and second thing, I mean, the, the numbers that Altro recalls uh, are tremendous regarding the needs for financing of the transition of corporates and SMEs. And so far, uh, we probably do not have a well-balanced financial sector in Europe. So the rebalancing towards capital market union, I mean, having a real functioning capital market union, also will be based on banking sector having some visibility of what they can do. Uh, in the in the years, so I think the timeline there is really trying to nail it now, so that we can focus on prospective reflection for the future. Thank you very much. Final word for the presidency of the yeah. council. That's the first. I'm very sure. Pressure is high yeah. for you to finish by by June. No? <laughs> exactly. So that's what I take from 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 this uh, lot of interesting discussions and interesting reflections. Uh, two things. Uh, what is the stake in Trino? Is uh, the title of, of this roundtable. A lot, obviously, from these discussions. Secondly, uh, everybody pretty much wants this uh, finished by June, so uh, it will be a, a busy couple of months. So mm -hmm. I think that with us. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let's Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, you had a. Which we